A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, you heard me kind of complaining about the fact that it's kind of hard to preach on the parable of the Good Samaritan because it's so familiar, it's so well known, it, it is such a vivid story, and it's pretty obvious, you know, the moral of the story in so many ways. It's almost like, what is there to say about it? Obviously, I still came up with something to say about it last week. But having said that, let me simply say that the short passage from the gospel that we heard today is actually even harder to preach on simply because the story is so succinct, it's so short, it's so lacking in detail, and when you're done reading it, you're kind of going, really? Is that what Jesus said to Martha? Is that all there is to it? The story is kind of unsatisfying. And so in terms of taking it as scripture, being something that we're supposed to apply to our lives, can be kind of difficult, and especially, too, since it's not a parable, it's not a story that Jesus told, it's instead an episode that he experienced in his life that the writer of the Gospel of Luke thought would be good to include at this point in the Gospel. So this is what happened to Jesus. This is what he said. What are we to learn from that? That's a harder thing to come to terms with than a parable that he told specifically with a lesson in mind. 
So let's give it a go this morning anyway and see what we can make of this passage. So the first thing for us to see is is the setting. What's going on here? Jesus is traveling along with his disciples and we're told that they entered a certain place. We aren't told what that place is. Does Luke know what this place is? We don't know, but he doesn't bother giving it a name. Now, when he comes to this place, he encounters the home of Martha and her sister Mary that is living there. There's only one other place in the scriptures where we encounter Mary and Martha together as sisters, and that's in John chapter 11. The Gospel of John was written quite a bit later than the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, but there we learn that Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus lived in a town called Bethany. And of course, in that episode, Jesus goes and and Lazarus dies because of an illness, and Jesus ends up raising Lazarus from the dead. So that's the big deal in that story in John chapter 11. But what we also learn is that it seems Jesus already had a relationship with Martha and Mary and Lazarus, that they were already friends. Maybe Jesus had come to Bethany on several occasions or whatever, but there was a relationship already there. But in Luke, that's not what we have. This is the first time Jesus encounters Martha and Mary, and there's no mention of Lazarus at all, so who knows where he was or whatever. But this is the first encounter Jesus has with them. And this encounter is something that fits with the context that Luke has been taking us through. Two weeks ago, you might recall that Margaret was talking about how Jesus had sent out 70 of his disciples, two by two, into the villages where he would be going. And he gave them very practical instructions. He wanted them to go ahead and preach the gospel and heal the sick and raise the dead and all that kind of easy stuff, right? But he also gave them more specific instructions. He said, don't take anything for the journey. Don't bring a purse or an extra bag or extra sandals or extra cloak or whatever. Instead, when you come into a town, go to a home. Knock on the door. Offer your peace to that home. If they receive that peace, great. Stay there. If they don't, then go to the next place. And so when you stay there, he said... Eat whatever is set before you. Stay in that place. Don't look to upgrade your accommodation. Just stay put right there in this house that has been so hospitable to you. So Jesus is practicing what he preached. He comes into this town. Let's just go ahead and say it's Bethany. He comes into Bethany and walks up to this door and knocks on the door and Martha answers the door and he says, hi, peace be to you. I'm Jesus. Can I stay here at your place? And Martha welcomes him into her home. So Jesus comes into Martha's home and discovers that he ha- she has a sister Mary as well. And so what then develops is something that would be pretty straightforward. Martha starts doing things related to the fact that she now has a house guest. We aren't told exactly what it is that she's doing, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that she's preparing a meal for them. It's logical, makes sense. The text doesn't say that, but it makes sense that that would be what she is doing. And this is a good thing because that's what you do if you're going to be hospitable towards a guest. But what we see is Martha is there very busy, distracted, it says, with her many tasks. But Mary, on the other hand, is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to what he has to say. So now we just have to imagine that scenario. Jesus is in the living room. Martha's in the kitchen. It could have all been just one big room back then, actually. But nevertheless, Jesus is having something to say. So does this mean he's by himself talking one-on-one with Mary? Well, it's possible. Uh, It might also be, though, that he's not alone. Perhaps he's brought in a few of his apostles, maybe Peter, James, and John, his three closest apostles, maybe. So maybe the four of them are there, and Jesus has now continued to give them some instruction or whatever, and Mary has attached herself to the group and is there listening as well. Whether it's one-on-one or whether she's joining in instruction Jesus is giving to his apostles, it's significant that Luke says that she's sitting at his feet listening to what he has to say. Because that's descriptive of the posture of a disciple listening to the teachings of a rabbi. And traditionally, women never got to do that. But here Jesus is happy to have Mary take that posture, and Mary is bold enough to give it a go that she would even think, perhaps I can listen to this man speak, and so I'll sit at his feet like a disciple, which isn't normally what would happen. I don't know how many of you might have seen the Barbara Streisand movie, Yentl. 
But in that movie, it was really clear that women weren't allowed to really study Torah and stuff. That was for the men, and women just got to have simpler things. And that was one of the challenges Yentl faced in that story. So it's not dissimilar here. Mary is experiencing something pretty cool, especially given the fact that she's a woman. But here she is listening to Jesus talk, and Jesus is happy to have her listening as well. Meanwhile, over in the kitchen, Martha's there doing all this work, and she's getting perturbed. She's not happy. She's upset. She's not only distracted, she's really probably a little ticked off at her sister. And so finally, she turns to Jesus in a rather bold way and says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? When she says, Lord, by the way, that that doesn't have to mean that she's recognizing Jesus as a person worthy of worship. Uh, It's probably the equivalent of just kind of saying, sir, you know, or good teacher or whatever. Like she recognizes he's a notable person. And so she's saying, can you help me out here, really? And then she tells him what to do. Tell my sister to come in and help me with the meal, meal preparations. Now, why would she be so bold as to do that? Isn't that a little presumptuous? Well, we got to remember, we're in first century Palestine. Obviously, Mary is not listening to her ostensibly older sister and is just doing whatever she wants. So all Martha can do is turn to a man and tell this man to tell this woman what to do because then she'll listen. That's the expectation, right? That's the way the culture worked back then. But Jesus's response is not what is to be expected. And this is where it gets to be a challenge. Jesus, first of all, responds to Martha tenderly, where he says her name twice. It's as as, uh, Margaret read in the reading, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted about so many things. But there's only one thing that's necessary. And then he says, Mary has chosen the better part and what she has will not be taken from her. Which basically means... Sorry, Martha, no, I'm not going to tell Mary to help you. And that's how the episode ends. And that sounds very dissatisfactory. I was talking about this passage with my own mom several years ago, and she was frustrated with it. It's like, look, like like Martha's getting supper. Someone's got to make dinner happen. Like, that's the way it works. Everybody can't just play around and just enjoy whatever. And, 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 and she said that it's like Jesus is being unfair to Martha and doesn't care that Martha's doing what needs to be done. Instead, he just says, Mary can do this because this is better than whatever you're doing, Martha. And this is what makes this episode challenging. Is Jesus being unfair? Is he being chauvinistic, perhaps? Is Martha just getting the short end of the stick? How are we supposed to take this, especially if this is part of our scriptures that are supposed to inform us into our life as followers of Jesus? Should we be like Jesus in a situation like this? Well, the church has certainly spent time over the past 2,000 years trying to figure this out. And because this is seen as scripture, They thought, okay, what really is going on here? What's happening? Because clearly, Jesus thinks what Mary is doing is better than whatever Martha is doing. So let's look for the deeper meaning in the scriptures. And what often happens when we look for a deeper meaning in the scriptures is we often step over into allegorizing what we've read. And what that means is every piece of the story means something else or represents something else. Now again, when Jesus is telling a parable, like the parable of the sower, for example, he deliberately means that as an allegory. Whereas the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's not meant as an allegory. But if you were to take a story like that and allegorize it, it's a bit easier to do, a bit more acceptable. But but here, if this is what Jesus just experienced and how the conversation went, allegorizing it isn't a really good idea. And here's why. Here are some of the allegories the church has come up with. They had said that Martha represents the active life and Mary represents the contemplative life. And so the active life is everyday life, running the household, paying the bills, earning a crust, you know, doing what you got to do, running around, taking care of the kids, all that kind of stuff, right? The contemplative life is where you pull back and just spend time contemplating God and life, the universe and everything. And you can imagine 
Who came up with that interpretation? Early on in the first couple hundred years of the church's history, there were people that were known as the desert fathers and the desert mothers. These are individuals who would pull back out of society, off into the wilderness, live by themselves, and that's what they would do. They would just simply make sure they could eat something or they would fast a lot, and they would contemplate things of God and the universe. And they would be the ones more inclined to suggest that this is the better thing than just living everyday life like normal people do. Um, Even today, in monasteries and convents where monks and nuns live the contemplative life, yes, their life is a combination of work and prayer, but it is done with the intention that it all would be this contemplative life, thinking about God primarily and all the time. Now, it's not bad to do that, but to try to suggest that it is inherently better than everyday life, I think is stressing the point a little bit. And again, that allegorizing of the story betrays the people who are making that allegory. We live the contemplative life, therefore it is the better thing, so let's show how Jesus is saying that what we're doing is better than what the regular people are doing. I say that with a wave of a hand. I'm not trying to suggest that they were arrogant about it. I'm just saying that it's easy to like that view. As we fast forward into the Protestant Reformation, a couple other allegories were used. One of them was that Martha represents justification by works, and Mary represents justification by faith. Another way of putting that is salvation by doing good deeds and salvation by the grace of God. And this was one of the arguments in the Reformation. How is it that we gain favor with God? Do we have to do a bunch of good things so that God approves of us and likes us and then gets us to heaven? Or do we simply put our faith in Christ and receive it as a gift that God gives and we get to go to heaven that way? And so people have taken that to be what this is all about. Problem is, Jesus never talked in those terms. That's a conversation that comes up later with the Apostle Paul. So to try to say that this is what this means is once again reflecting a favored theological position and using the parable, or sorry, using the episode as being meant to inform why this is better than that. And perhaps the most egregious way is back in the Reformation, the thought was, Martha represents Catholics, and Mary represents Protestants. And so since Mary has chosen the better way, we know what that means, don't we, right? It's painfully obvious that we're using this story so often over the course of our history to try to justify whatever our favorite approach is. In fact, let me add one more that's even worse. The thought was Martha represents Judaism and Mary represents Christianity. And because of thoughts like that, that has helped inform the long stream, really river. Heck, it's been a torrent of anti-Semitism throughout the history of the Christian faith because of conclusions like that. So anyway... I say all of that to say that we have tried to figure out what we do with this story. And I'm going to suggest to you that allegorizing it like that is not the way to go. So what do we do with it? What's going on? The first thing we must recognize is that Martha isn't doing anything wrong. She's not failing. She's not sinning. If anything, she's being very conscientious about what the Hebrew Bible is talking about because over and over again, you'll read from the prophets in the Hebrew Bible that they're being critical of Israel precisely because they were not being hospitable to strangers. They were not opening up their homes in love to those who were in need. They were not showing favor to those who were traveling through and they were supposed to. That was in the Torah and they weren't doing it. So Martha is conscientiously trying to be a good host. And again, we aren't told if she was making a meal, maybe she's trying to get the bed made and stuff like that. Whatever it was, we can make the assumption that she was doing this to serve this guest that she had in her house. And again, whether Jesus was by himself or he had a few of his apostles with him, um, and for that matter, whether Martha knew Jesus or knew of Jesus beforehand, like did she already hear about him and, and knew that he was extra special or is this the very first time that she had ever met the guy and, and is just happy to, 
be a good host. The point is, she's working hard at being a good host and doing what the Torah says. Nothing wrong with that. So one other interpretation was thinking, well, when Jesus says to her, Martha, you're worried about so many things and distracted by so many things, but only one thing is necessary. One assumption is she's trying to put on a lavish spread for him, right? She's trying to put on a five-course meal and she's trying to get the fish together and the steak and the salad and all this kind of stuff. And Jesus is trying to say, look, only one thing is necessary. Look, I, I, I just need a soup and a bun, right? Like, don't worry about the big spread. Just, just soup and a bun is just fine kind of thing. I think that has better merit than these other attempts. We've tried to interpret it, but again, we really can't read it that way because that's not what's going with what Jesus is saying. The one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the better part. So what's happening? The thing that we have to come down to is that Martha is simply failing to recognize the uniqueness of the situation that they're in. She's doing a good thing, in being hospitable, but she's failing to recognize that the opportunity is right there before her to listen to what Jesus has to say just like Mary is. Jesus' response to Martha is actually an implicit invitation to come and sit right next to her sister and listen to what he has to say. Now, again, the criticism might come, well, well, the thing is, who's going to make supper then? Supper ain't going to make itself. You know, somebody's got to do this. But why would we ever think that Jesus would allow them to starve and go hungry? Why would we ever think that Jesus would say, okay, so that's the lesson for tonight, so let's have supper. When's supper going to be? Why isn't supper ready? How come there's no food to eat? Like, why, why would we even think Jesus would do that? If, if they were busy listening to him, then he'd be happy then for Martha and Mary to go ahead and get the dinner together and they eat later or whatever. The big thing is for us to hold on to this idea. It's been said that the enemy of the best, the enemy of the best is not the bad, but the good. Because doing something good is good. And, and you can be satisfied with that. And that's not bad. But if there is a best that is above the good, we can sometimes fail to see the opportunity for the best because we see the good that we're trying to do. Martha is thinking, I have to be hospitable. I have a guest. I have to feed the guest. I have to get the bed ready. I have to make this good. And especially because this is a really honorable man to have, this is good for me to do that. And Jesus is just trying to say to her, Martha, what is best right now is for you to come and listen to what I have to say, just like Mary has. Mary has chosen the better part. Rather than helping you, which would be good, she's chose the better. She's listening to me. She's hearing the voice of God, you could say. She's hearing how the scriptures might be amplified to her, perhaps in a way that she normally wouldn't get because she's a woman. Here, that opportunity is there. You get to hear something directly that normally wouldn't be made available to you. The better thing would be to leave those things aside for now. We'll get to them later. Come and join your sister and listen to what I have to say. With that understanding now, it isn't invalidating what Martha is doing. It isn't being unfair to Martha. It's really inviting Martha to do the same thing. And it's recognizing that there is a time and a place where what we need to do is put aside the regular requirements and obligations we have in favor of listening to Jesus. So what does that look like for us today? Well, I would suggest to you that that means making sure that we do not shirk our responsibilities. I'm not saying that we pull back from society and go off to a different place and just live the contemplative life, but there is time and good reason for us to take contemplative time periodically. In Anglican practice, the suggestion is that would be done every day. That's what morning prayer and evening prayer are all about, using those disciplines. Taking time in the morning, taking time in the evening to pull back from your responsibilities, spend some time reading the Bible, praying, thinking about what's going on. 
The practice of Lectio Divina is a good way to do that, where you read a short passage of scripture, and then you think about what this means. What could God be saying to me through this? How would I apply this to my life? Doing this kind of thing actually helps set priorities for us and enables us to approach the rest of life in a fashion that is well-grounded. And truth be told, even outside of religious contexts, it's been proven that taking like 20 minutes of meditation and silence and solitude benefits our mental health and by extension our physical health, brings us into a place of where we're ready to be more expansive to others and approach the day in a much more positive and balanced way. This is being discovered even without the religious overtone. So I would say to you today, what we learn from this episode in Jesus' life is really coming down to illustrating one of the ways that we can love God. We said earlier that in this chapter, Jesus was asked a question by a lawyer, how, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what does the Torah say? He says, love God, love your neighbor. Jesus says, you're right. Then he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan to talk about loving neighbor. And here Luke has put this episode in Jesus's life as an illustration of one of the ways to love God. How can we show love for God? Let's sit at God's feet and listen to what God has to say and contemplate what that means for how we live our lives moving forward from that place. Let's endeavor to do it daily, but let's at least endeavor to do it for the sake of moving forward in the love of God. Amen.